We're going to be in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be starting in verse um, 43 of John chapter 4. All right. And I titled today's message, You're in Good Hands. You're in Good Hands. John chapter 4, verse 43 through 50. And I'm just going to pray real fast before uh, we get started. So dear God, we just want to thank you so much for another Sunday, uh, just to gather together and um, open your word and that we live in a country where we get to do this stuff publicly and invite people to church publicly. And Lord, I just pray as the cooks and the pierces are out camping and all those other families that they would just be refreshed during their last day out there in the mountains and that they just have such a sweet Sunday out there and just a safe drive home. And Lord, we pray for Lindsay as she's about to give birth soon. And we pray for this precious little baby girl um, that's about to come into this world. Lord, we pray that you just give the doctors wisdom um, and the nurses wisdom on um, just this birth, Lord, and that you just keep her just safe and um, keep Lindsay safe. And I just pray that you just give their family just a peace that surpasses all understanding, God. And um, we're, we're just so excited to meet this little girl and um, have her just raised up at this church. And um, Lord, we just pray that today as we get into your word that you would speak to us and you would encourage us wherever we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we... Uh, finished up the story of the Samaritan woman and her encounter with Jesus. And her life was radically changed when she met Jesus. She had a pretty crazy past, and but she met Jesus. And then where did she go last week um, and tell people about her encounter with Jesus? Does anyone remember? She went back to... Yeah, back to town. And she started telling everybody, you have to meet this man who told me everything I've ever done. And, and she starts evangelizing. And God used her in a mighty way to save a lot of people in Samaria where a lot of Jews would just avoid this area. And I think this should really bless us because she had a pretty crazy past. But God used her even in her crazy past to impact this whole city and that should bless us because if God could use her she can also use us you know and that just brings joy to my heart and we'll see today that Jesus is going to impact another man and um, he's going to put his faith in Jesus and then he's going to go and share his faith in Jesus with his whole household and guess what happens to his whole household they get saved. And so it's really cool just to see all these different stories on how God gets a hold of our lives and then uses us to reach other people. So let's read uh, verse 43 through 45 of John chapter 4. Now, after two days, he departed from there, Samaria, and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the signs he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So after two days, remember when the whole village came out to Jesus, the village begged Jesus to stay in Samaria for two more days and just to teach them, spend some time with them. And so after two days with the Samaritans, Jesus headed up to Galilee. Now the Samaritans, they in the past didn't have any dealings with Jews. They hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. But by the time of this, two days have ended with Jesus. Like they're seeing, they have Jesus on their shoulders, you know, not really, but they're probably saying, you know, he's a jolly good fellow. And, you know, they're, they're stoked that Jesus came into their town and shared the good news with them. And many people believed. In Samaria, Jesus was honored 
And we know that because a lot of them believed in him. They listened to him. They were very thankful and they wanted Jesus to stay there with them. And Jesus enjoyed his stay because they did listen. They believed. They acknowledged that he was, we remember last week, the Samaritan said, this man is the savior of the world. But now he's going back to his own country, his hometown in Galilee. The Samaritans embrace the Jewish Messiah, yet the hometown crowd, they're not going to honor Jesus. Um, As Jesus said in verse 44 there, a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now, the idea of honor carries the meaning of reverence or respect. And this statement is found actually in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus said, a prophet has no honor in his own country. And it speaks of those in his hometown. They didn't honor him because they didn't have faith in him. Um, You might ask, well, how could this be? Well, familiarity breeds contentment. And they saw Jesus being raised from a little guy. And you would think that they would believe that he was the Messiah. But... um, they were just so used to Jesus, they're like, there's no way this guy is sent from God. Uh, Jesus said in Mark 6, 3, that people scoffed at him teaching in his hometown. So when he would teach in his hometown, people would scoff at him and said that he's just the carpenter, the son of Mary. There's nothing special about them. They refused to believe in him because they were close to him. They didn't think that he was actually from God. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, his own family said, Jesus, is he's just out of his mind. And that means like to pretty much be like besides yourself. Like he just is a crazy. Um, but in John 7, 5, it says, even Jesus's own brothers didn't believe in him growing up. And it won't be until after the resurrection. So once Jesus rises from the dead, their eyes are just open. They're like, oh my goodness, he really was who he's said to be. And you know that his brothers, I believe it was uh, James and John, ended up following Jesus and making an impact for him as they saw that their brother really did rise from the dead. He really was who he claimed to be. And they ended up giving their lives for what Jesus did. So just because you're in close proximity doesn't mean that relationship is going to be great. Jesus grew up with all these people. They were close to Jesus. They were near to Jesus, but they weren't believers in Jesus. And you can see this often in like marriages. People say, oh yeah, like we're married. We sleep in the same bed. We we stay in the same house, but they don't have a close relationship. You can be really near to somebody, but if you don't work on that relationship, you can still have distance there. Or even, you know, with your kids, like you can raise your kids, be around your kids, but you could still not have a a good relationship with them, even though they're near all the time. The same thing with people at church. You can be very near to God, the people of God, but that doesn't mean if you come to church that you are a Christian. This shows that you can be near to God, but also far from him. I don't know if you know Billy Graham. You guys know Billy Graham? Uh, Like one of the most... Uh, influential preachers. I think he preached the gospel to min- millions of people. So many people he, he impacted to give their lives to Jesus. But his son, Franklin Graham, all right, so Franklin probably heard the gospel more than any person who's ever lived this. His dad was Billy Graham. Okay, but Franklin was a pretty big rebel. And it wasn't till the age of 22 that he made his decision for Jesus. He was near to the gospel. He was raised you know, with the Bible and the gospel. Um, But he said in an interview, just because my dad is Billy doesn't mean I go to heaven. Um, I had to make that personal decision myself, he said. And in Mark chapter six, verse six, it says Jesus marveled at their unbelief in his hometown. He, he He couldn't believe that he was there and they didn't believe that he was really God. Now, what's interesting in verse 45, we just read, it says that his hometown on this visit, what did they do at his visit in verse 45? When, they, when he came to Galilee, the Galileans, what did they do? Received they received him. All right, at his visit. Now, that word received means to welcome, to greet. 
uh, to be hospitable, they received him based on the signs and wonders that he had done in Jerusalem and what he could do. Now, they were intrigued by him, kind of like um, they heard, you know, he was doing all these miracles now. And, and, you know, you have like the flavor of the day, the soup of the day, like Jesus is starting to become popular. And they heard of his wild behavior at the Passover. He was flipping tables, you know, um, he was making a whip, he, you know, busting Indiana Jones moves on the Temple Mount. And they're like, wait, I know Jesus. Like, what is he doing? And, you know, he was cleaning house at the temple. And they started hearing about this in his hometown and how he drove out the money changers. And so he, Jesus kind of is becoming popular and famous. There's this buzz going around about Jesus. And they weren't curious in his hometown of who he was, but what he could do. They're like, what in the world is Jesus doing now? He, he turned water into wine. He, he's, you know, doing these miracles in Jerusalem. And to be excited about someone is not the same as putting faith and belief in them. The Samaritan said he is the savior, but the Galilean said he's just the super cool guy who could do super cool stuff and he's coming to our hometown. I wonder what he's going to do. So they received him. And so let's read verse 46 through 47. It says, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea and Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. All right, so what was the first miracle Jesus did? He turned water into wine. All right, and you know, Jesus pretty much demonstrated his love and blessing on marriage. He was at the, the marriage and does this miracle. The second miracle we're going to see today, we will see Jesus demonstrate his love for the family unit, unit and kids. So he, he kind of like shows his love for this married couple. Now he's going to show his love for this family and this kid that was about to die. And I'll have to say the hardest thing I've ever done in life, and I'm only two and a half years in deep, but is raising kids. Like I, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. I, could, I never could have imagined how hard it is, but it is also the most rewarding thing that I've ever experienced. And just to see a little kid happy to see you when you get home, run into your arms or say daddy, say mommy, is just like the sweetest thing ever. And to see them grow up, but it's hard work. But this nobleman, it, it's, this man is called a nobleman, which means one who belongs to a king. And you might ask, well, what king was ruling during that area in that time? This nobleman probably worked for Herod Antipas. And so this king was wealthy. He probably dressed really well, um, probably rode in on a horse, an entourage. Um, he was the king's man, a man of great wealth, power, and influence. And this man heard the news of this miracle worker named Jesus. As, you know, Jesus started getting his reputation for doing these miracles and these signs and wonders and um, kind of stirring up the religious leaders. And we were told that this nobleman had a son who was sick at Capernaum. So that's 20 miles away from um, Galilee. And most likely the only thing this government official knows about Jesus is there's a man who can do miracles. And he didn't have faith in Jesus personally before. But he has faith that possibly Jesus could heal my son. If he can do all these miracles, maybe he could touch my son. And he's like, I don't really care who healed my son or how it gets done, but I want to make sure that my son is healed. And even though he had all the wealth, he had all the nice cars, he had horses, but he could do nothing for his son. And I'm sure that he sought out all the best doctors of the land. He did everything he possibly could, but exhausted all of his options. And, and we can see from this passage, this man was desperate to save his son's life. And it's been said that sickness and death is the great equalizer. It all comes to us 
out of 10 people, how many people die? 10. 10 out of 10 people die. Like, you can't get around it, you know? And the rich and the poor alike must deal with the unseen emergencies of life. And your place in life does nothing to detour trials. They come to all of us. Uh, the rain falls on the rich and the poor. And there's nothing you can do to get around. You know, Jesus said that in this life you will have tribulations. You're going to have trials. You're going to have hard times. And even though this man was really powerful, I'm sure he was feeling pretty weak in the ability to fix his son. And us as parents can understand how he felt when our kids are sick. Like when my kids are sick, they're throwing up or in pain. I wish I could just be the one, take that pain and throw it myself or, or take that broken arm or whatever. Like I hate to see my kids suffer. And that's what this guy is like. I, I, I just want my, my son to live. And it's so hard to see them go through that. And so he comes 20 miles to meet this carpenter who could do miracles. And he begins to beg Jesus as he would do anything he could for his son. Now with his child endangered, this man does the wisest thing any parent can do. He brought the situation to Jesus. All right, I'm sure he tried so many different options on how to fix his son, but he just says, you know what? I'm going to bring my friend to Jesus. And that's the best thing that we can do. If we do anything as parents or as friends to, to other people, may we bring our children and friends to Jesus. That should be our aim in parenting above anything else. Just bringing our kids to Jesus, leading our family to Jesus. And as fathers, you know, we should teach our kids, you know, how to be a man, how to provide, how to throw a curveball, how to fix the car, how to do all these great things. But number one priority should be to teach our sons the word of God. And as we raise daughters, you know, it's great to teach them how to do their makeup and, you know, do good at school, get a career, you know, uh, take care of her family, take care of kids. But number one priority should be to teach our kids, our, our daughters and our sons about Jesus to love, honor, and obey them, the, to obey the Lord. That is the most important thing we can pass on to them. And if we teach our kids these things, we're shooting them out straight for the target that God wants us to and how he wants us to raise them. And we know and can be confident that God is pleased when we bring our children or other people to him. And this is what this guy does. He, he brings the situation to Jesus. It's so important to be teaching our kids biblical things. And it's been really cool when, as my son Harley is only two and a half years old, but now he's starting to get the concept of prayer. And like we pray a lot. And so all of a sudden we start catching him say amen, because we say amen at the end of the prayer. And so he'll say amen. And recently when I put him down to bed, we'll read a fun book and then we'll read like a Bible story and then we'll pray. And then he's been praying for little brother and mommy and daddy. And it's just so cool to see him develop as we're training him, you know, in the Lord. And a question that we've constantly should be asking ourselves, and I constantly ask myself, is this, if your kid grew up and loved the Lord exactly as much as you do, how much would your child love the Lord? You know, would he be, would you be okay to say, yes, I, I hope that my child would love the Lord as much as I do. Um, you know, would they study and read the Bible as much as you do daily? Do they make it a habit? Do they see you make it a priority in your life? You know, it's good for us to ask ourselves these tough questions. You know, if your child grew up and treated your spouse or others exactly how you treated other people, how are, you know, they, they follow suit. And so when they see you deal with other people, they're going to deal with other people that way. And so we got to be very careful because their little eyes are watching us and copying us. So that, let's see here. So yeah, they're listening and watching regardless if they act like it or not. They're watching how we live our life and taking notes on how they're going to live theirs. So this nobleman and his family, 
They were set up for life, but they still had problems like everyone else. And this is certain, uh, there are certain things that come in life that are no respecters of persons, like cancer, death, all that kind of stuff. You can have all the money in the world, but you can still get that horrible doctor's visit or, you know, come up with a, a disease, a deadly one. There's no fending them off. And so often, God will use our problems and our trials to bring us back to him, all right? So just like this man, he's got a gnarly, probably one of the biggest trials he's ever faced as a father. And where does he run to? To God. And um, so he heard about Jesus and his miracle working power. And he asked him, please heal my son. And we all go through very difficult times and trials ups and downs, good times, hard times. And, you know, if you say, well, I haven't, Ryan, well, it's going to come. Eventually, it's going to come. The question is, where are we going to put our faith when the trials hit, when the waves come? You know, are we going to be building our lives upon the, like the solid word of God? And, you know, the Bible talks about like when the storms come, we're not going to be blown over. Or are we building our life on shifty sand? If we build our lives on, you know, the, the word of God, the truth, we're not going to be blown over when those uh, things come in life. It's important to just to trust Jesus and cast your care upon him. Bring that need to him and then believe in him that he cares about you. And then just put your situation in the hands of Jesus. And so when we put our situation in the hands of Jesus, um, it's going to help us not to worry, not to hurry. And you just kind of surrender. Say, I can't figure this out on my, my own, Lord. I, I got to give this to you. I trust you um, because you are God. Uh, what's that verse? It, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplications, let your requests be known to the Lord, and the peace of God will surprise something like that will God will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding and sometimes when we get through those trials you, we're just distraught and we can't think straight but when we bring it to the Lord and just say God like this is bigger than I can even handle right now like you got to take over and it's crazy because when we do that it's weird but all of a sudden you'll get this peace that surpasses all understanding um, which is amazing And so if we're hurting and just having a super hard time, I want to encourage us all just to give it to Jesus and he will help us to stop worrying about it and um, he, he will give us that peace. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, uh, cast all your care upon Jesus for he cares for you. And in Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And so, again, Jesus, one of Jesus' favorite words is just come to me. And you'll see this in several verses throughout the Bible. But God just wants us to, to come with our problems to him and um, he, he'll help us get through those very tough seasons. And so we're going to kind of go through six different points of this noble man. And uh, so having this man's faith is seen in six different ways as we look at this story. Uh, number one, he went to Jesus. And we see this picture of his faith in Jesus, his last attempt to save his son. Now, what is sad is we often put our faith in ourselves, in our own resources, in our own abilities and efforts to work out the difficulties we're in. And then when all else fails, then we go to Jesus last. And that's the wrong order. You know, we often pray last, but our last resort should always be our first resort because our resources are pathetic compared to Jesus's resources. God's resources are unlimited. And 
I think we should be wise and use our brains and use doctors, use medicine and all that good stuff. But let's bring it to Jesus first and have him guide and direct us in every single decision we make. And trust that he's going to work everything out according to his plan. And so the second thing we see this man's faith is he implored Jesus. Implore means to ask or request, but it's in the imperfect tent. So he kept on asking, continually asking Jesus is the verbiage in here. He didn't give up. He didn't just ask Jesus, hey, could you kill my son? And then just walk away. No, he kept on. He was persistent. He didn't throw in the towel or quit. He kept the faith. And this is... Uh, kind of cool. Um, you know that one verse right here that says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find and knock. All right, check this out. So, so ask, seek, and knock. If you take the first letter of each one of those, what is it? What is it? it may, yeah, it makes the word ask, okay? And, and it just kind of is a reminder, just keep on asking. You know, Paul prayed how many times for God to heal him with his thorn in his flesh? It was three times. He was just persistent, kept on asking. You know, how many times did Jesus ask his father before he went to the cross to take that cup from him? Three times. Because this guy kept asking, it was a demonstration of his faith. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, you're weak if you pray more than once for one thing. Like, that's not big faith. No, it's showing that you're constantly depending on Jesus. You, you have big faith because you're continually coming to him over and over again. You're not giving up on him. You're continuing your faith in him. And I hope that we would never give up on a situation that looks hopeless um, or throw in the towel. That we would just keep on bringing it to Jesus. Uh, James 5 16 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and and so like my mom she constantly was praying for me i would show up late and she was just faithful in her closet on her face praying for me even when i was being a knuckle and she never stopped praying for me and she would keep on bringing it to her women's bible studies in the church and they just kept praying for me and then one day boom you know my light bulb went on and i've heard you know story after story of people praying for someone for 50 60 years and and that person that prayed for them ended up passing away but then that person that they were praying for realized that life is short and and they ended up giving their life to Jesus, maybe because that person passed away or someone else brought the gospel. And so you just never know um, how the, God is just going to use your prayers, but never stop praying. Prayer is powerful. Uh, let's read verse 48. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. So at first it seems like, wow, Jesus, like this guy just comes to you and says, please heal my son. And you say, unless you see signs or wonders, you, you won't believe. And uh, it kind of seems a little harsh from Jesus, but he's not just responding to this man. There's a crowd around him. There's an entourage around him. There's a lot of people and these Galileans didn't believe in Jesus. And they invited him because he was doing all these signs and wonders. And Jesus kind of rebukes them and says, hey, unless you guys see these signs and wonders, you know, uh, by no means, you, you will by no means believe. And when he says this, it's in the plural pronoun, he's rebuking the crowd around this man. And you remember this rich guy arriving in town, he probably had a whole bunch of group of people with him. And this group of people in this town, they wanted something from Jesus without giving their life to Jesus. And Jesus kind of calls that out here. He says, these crowds of people are interested in me because of my miracles only, not because of my mission, not because I'm the Messiah, not because I'm the savior of the world. They just want a free lunch out of me. They just want health and wealth out of me. They don't, uh, that, that's all they want. And Jesus is addressing people who are seeking to get miracles out of him without wanting their souls to be fixed by him. And in verse 49, it says, The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. 
So can you hear that desperation? He says it again, like, please just come to my hometown. Uh, my, my son's about to die. I'm not here to argue these signs and these, you know, wonders. I have a sick kid and it, this is in the continuous tense in the Greek. It, it's over and over. This man said, please just come and heal my son. Lord, please heal him. Please, please come. And in verse 50, Jesus said to him, go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And so this is the third point how we saw his faith. Um, he believed in the words of Jesus. Jesus said it, and he believed it. The man believed the word Jesus spoke to him. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. And so this fella heard the word of God himself, that your son is healed, and therefore he believed. And that is one reason why we place such a great importance on the teaching of God's word. And we come here every Sunday to study God's word because it is God's word that begins to grow and mature our faith. We get a faith boost when we hear the word of God. It's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, not signs and wonders, not miraculous occurrences. True saving faith is based on the word of God because that's where the power is. Uh, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And you know, we do believe miracles are for today. They still happen. And signs and wonders do happen. But signs and wonders do not bring us into a place of true saving faith. It's through hearing, not seeing. Uh, Jesus told Thomas in John 20, 29. I don't have this verse. Uh, but blessed are those, remember Thomas doubting Thomas. He came to Jesus and uh, Jesus says, look, Thomas, like here's where I was pierced. Here's my side. And Jesus told him, blessed are those who have not seen and believed. You know, and we can't see how our circumstances are going to end up in the future, how things are going to work out tomorrow or next week or, or next year. It's kind of like unknown. And I don't know how everything is going to be orchestrated in my life, but by faith, I believe that God is on the throne. He's going to work everything out for good to those who believe in him and are called according to his purpose. And by faith, I believe he's going to work everything out to his perfect will. And when things get scary around us, we know that Jesus is bigger than all that kind of stuff. That the stuff that's going on in the world doesn't scare him. He's working it according to his plan and his will is ultimately going to be done. No one is stronger than God. And um and it's just awesome that we serve a God who's bigger than anything we'd ever face. The fourth thing that we see in this, about this man's faith is he was obedient to Jesus, number four. At the end of verse 50, I love this, it says he went his way. Jesus said, go your way. And what does he do? He went his way. He, he was obedient. This speaks of obedience to Jesus. Jesus told him to go, and he did. And that speaks of his faith being seen in his actions. We might say he put feet to his faith. And I think it's an important point. It is one thing for us to say we have faith. A lot of people have lip service. And, and then I think there's some statistics that 80% of America says we're Christians. But you look at their actions, and their actions will say, uh, uh by their fruit, you'll know them. And they, they don't have saving faith. We can say we have faith all day long. I believe Jesus and, and I follow Jesus. But you know, those are just words coming out of our mouths. How do we know we truly have faith and really believe? What well, is based on what we do and the actions of our life? Uh, James 2.14 says, faith by itself, it's dead. If um, if it doesn't have works, it's dead. And we're not saved by works. We, we have faith in Jesus Christ, 
You know, I could say all day long, I have faith that chair will hold me, but if I never sit in that chair, do I really have faith in it? No, like, I'm going to test it out, you know, and if I really put all my weight on that chair, it's like I have faith in that chair. And I could say all day long, I believe in Jesus, I want to follow Jesus, but if I, you look at my life and I'm, you know, cussing out people and I'm doing these different things, like Jesus says, love your enemies, you know, and all these different stuff, you know, I'm just a hypocrite. And how do we know that Noah and Abraham had saving faith. Noah, God told him to build a what? An ark. And then we know he had saving faith because it, 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 was, it didn't rain back then. And so that was a big step of faith for him to build this ark. But we know Noah had saving faith because he obeyed God and built this ark when he couldn't see any rain or there's a flood. Like, what are you talking about? And, um, or Abraham. You know, Abraham, God told him to take his own son's life. And it's like, oh my gosh, like, are you serious? By faith, he took his son up to that mountain, put him on the altar, and was about to take his son's life because God told him to do it. But God was testing his faith. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, God stopped him and was testing to see if he would really obey him. And his son wasn't killed, but he was a, God saw, okay, Abraham is obedient to me. So if we have true saving faith, it will be realized in our actions. My actions are proof that I really follow and believe Jesus. All right, let's read verse 51 through 52. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So they said, your son lives. And I couldn't imagine that joy that just like sparked up. And, you know, if you get that, if you say, oh, you might have cancer. And they come back and say, it's gone. Like, it's just that amazing feeling of excitement and joy. Um, then he inquired of them immediately you know, when did my son get healed? Like, I've been gone for a day, but when did he get healed? And they said, yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon, the seventh hour, the fever left him. And he's like, oh my goodness, that's when Jesus said, your son lives, you know, go home. And that was a 20 mile journey from where Jesus and this nobleman were to his hometown. And he could have, this nobleman, there's something interesting that just happened here. This nobleman could have, when Jesus said that at one o'clock, he could have gotten home in 20 miles by the time the sun went down. But he, it says it happened yesterday, so this man didn't show up to his house until the following day. Something interesting is happening here. But it seems that this man spent the night in Cana, in Galilee, where he had this conversation with Jesus, and then went to Capernaum the next day. So... Now that's, you know, faith in the word. I'm going to, he pretty much said, I I'm going to sleep here tonight. Like he was at peace. Um, I believe that man's promise, you know, if he didn't have faith in Jesus, I mean, I think I would have been booking at home as soon as Jesus said, go home. Like, is he really, you know, alive, you know? But this man stayed a night in Galilee. And I mean, you can imagine he was probably like searching all these doctors. He's probably exhausted. Um, and the fifth thing I, I see that he had true faith in Jesus is he had peace from Jesus. Number five up there. Um, the nobleman spent the night in Cana. You know, Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. But he had such faith in Jesus' ability to heal his son. He was in no rush to get home. He's like, you know what? I'm exhausted. I'm just going to kick back in Galilee, get a hotel room, get a shower. And um, he had faith in Jesus' ability to heal his son. And that brought great peace to his heart. So he spent the night in Cana, most likely. And, and this makes me think of the great peace and rest that we so often miss out on because of our lack of faith in Jesus in our circumstances. You know, when something crazy goes on, like, we get pulled in all sorts of different directions, all sorts of thoughts in our heads, and we're like, go crazy, because we're not trusting in Jesus, and um, we're not taking every thought captive according to his word. 
And we have great peace available to every single one of us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the prince of what? Peace. That's one of his names. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled or be afraid. And so Jesus offers us peace, but we got to come to him, talk to him, bring it before him and put it into his hands. And he'll, he'll give us that peace that surpasses all understandings, no matter what you're facing in life, no matter how crazy it is. Because you know, God loves me. He cares about me. He's going to work this out for good, no matter what happens. And ultimately, if I die, I want to be in the presence of the Lord in heaven and paradise. So really, I've got peace, no matter what. So let's read verse 53 through 54. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So this nobleman believed Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior when this happened. And then this guy's evangelizing already. He gets saved, boom, and then evangelizes to his family right away. You got to meet this guy or you got to learn about this man. He's leading his whole household to faith in Jesus. And I, I love this, how it's almost Father's Day. And, you know, it's so powerful when you see a father lead his family to Jesus, to God. And you see this over and over again. If the dad gets saved, boom, his whole family usually gets saved. Um, and it's tragic because a lot of men that are in prison are from fatherless dads that aren't leading them, you know, to God, to Jesus. And it, it's a destruction. And Satan is having a heyday, like when fathers don't leave their family to God, it, it just becomes a mess. But it's so powerful when a dad will lead his family to Jesus. So number six, we know this guy had faith in God because he told others about Jesus. The nobleman comes back home and they're rejoicing about his son's healing. And this nobleman tells him exactly of his experience with Jesus and how Jesus said the word. And I can't believe you guys said it was at the, the, uh, the seventh hour because that's when Jesus said it. And he was healed just by the power of his words. And he tells his whole household, they all believe just like the woman at the well. Her life was impacted. She goes out and tells people and it spreads through the community. And the question for us all is what are we putting our faith in? Are we putting our faith in ourselves, our own resources, our abilities, or are we putting our faith in Jesus? And, you know, oftentimes, like, I'll find myself spinning in my head and, like, getting all sorts of rabbit trails, and I realize, oh, my goodness, Ryan, you're not praying. You're not bringing this before the Lord. You're not getting in your word. And when I do that, I get that peace that God offers. And so as we put our faith in Jesus for eternal life, you know, all Christians put major faith in Jesus for eternal life, that he's the way, but not that many people will put faith in Jesus for temporary life. They freak out. You know, they put all this faith in stock that Jesus will save them for all of eternity, but they're not good at doing it for the daily in and out of life, the so temporary. And I see three miracles in this chapter. Number one, the boy's healing. And then the second miracle, that boy's healing led to his dad's spiritual healing. That's miracle number two. And then number three, which led to the whole family being saved. And if the son didn't go through this trial of almost dying, who knows if the dad would have gotten saved? Who knows if the whole family would have gotten saved? So God used this situation, even though it was horrible, to get a hold of this man's life and his whole family. The dad's salvation came out of this boy's healing, which led to the whole family being saved. And Romans 8, 28 says, God works all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And this man's son was instantly healed. And does it work that way all the time? No, it doesn't always work that way. Um, you know, we pray to God to heal, and sometimes he chooses to do it later. Sometimes he does it right away. Sometimes um, he'll let that person pass away and heal them when they get to heaven. 
Um, sometimes God takes years to heal. And, you know, God's delays aren't necessarily his denials. Maybe he's working on something, doing something that behind the scenes we don't know about. And he's using that to, to work in our own hearts. And oftentimes, we've got to remember that God uses these trials and tribulations to bring people to saving faith in Him. And the noble man was right in how he went to Jesus, and we should applaud him for that awesome job. You went to Jesus, and we should follow him. When we have trials, go to Jesus. But he was wrong in one area I want to point out real fast. He told God how to fix it. He said, come to my house. And I want you to come and heal my son. And um, Matthew, a commentator, said this. We are encouraged to pray, but we are not allowed to prescribe. It's like going to the doctor. We bring our problems to the doctor. I have this cold. I have this flu. I am throwing up. I have a rash. But we're not allowed, once we get there, to get in the doctor's office and tell him our problems and then take his prescription pad and write our own prescriptions, are we? Like, we can't do that when we go to the doctor's. If we grabbed his notepad and says, you know, give me this and give me that. Like, that's not how it works. Um, so why do we, when we have problems... We go to God and bring our problems before him. You know, God, I have this in my life. Let me tell you how you're going to fix it. Oftentimes we'll say, this is how it needs to be. This is how you need to fix it, God. Let me tell you what you're going to do. And this is the best way to take care of the situation. Do you ever find yourself telling God, like, this is the best possible scenario. God, please just do it this way. And God just laughs at us because he knows ways we have no clue about. And just say this Jesus went to this man, it could have been too late because that's a 20 mile journey. But Jesus, this guy didn't realize that Jesus could just say, boom, your son's healed and boom, he's healed. He didn't have to go all the way there. And that is what this man did. Please heal my son and come to my house. Come with me right now. And he was telling God how to fix the problem. But Jesus had something else planned. From 20 miles away, the child was healed. And instantly, that was God's plan. And this man, he wanted to limit what God wanted to do. And we so often do this. Like, God has resources we have no clue about. And we limit God so often. But he thought he knew better. And we so often do as well. Now, the purpose of every divine work in the Gospel of John is ultimately written, the Bible says, that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing we'll have life in His name. And that's what happened here, didn't it? This sign caused this man and his household to believe in Jesus, and they all got saved. And, you know, whether we're near to God today or far away, um, you know, I've heard it said we're just one step back. No matter if you take a million steps away from God, you're just one step back. And, you know, I find myself often is just the busyness of life, the craziness of life. You start getting veered off. And, you know, it's good just to recalibrate. Keep coming back to Jesus. Get back into his word. Get back into, you know, listening to worship music. Um, the radio, Christian radio, uh, going to church. And, you know, God just wants that personal relationship with us. And, um, so I want to encourage you today, if you're not walking with God, to get back and step with Him and seek Him first. Ask, seek, and knock. Bring your problems to Him. He'll give you that peace that surpasses all understanding. And if there's those online that are watching and you want to give your life to Jesus, you could do that uh, today. And your life can be radically changed just like these people in these stories. So let's pray and if you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, you can just repeat this prayer after me. So dear God, we just want to thank you for your love for me. God, I believe in you just like this noble man. God, forgive me of my sins. I believe you are who you say you are. You are God, the Savior of the world. Lord, I believe that you rose again three days later from the grave, and that you're the only one that can get me to heaven and save me of my sins. 
And God, today I want to give my life to you and get on track with you. God, I want to follow you as my personal Lord and Savior. And God, just help me walk this life. In Jesus' name, amen.